If you taught a client to independently get ready for the day, which of the following methods would be the least effective if you wanted to program for maintenance? All right. We need to program to where these skills will persist once training is over. That's what maintenance is. So we need to find three effective ways of programming for maintenance and one ineffective. When you see this word least, that's what essentially you're finding, okay? You're gonna have three more or less incorrect, correct answers and one incorrect, correct answer, okay? Meaning three of these will be effective at programming for maintenance, one will not, okay? So you need to read it very carefully. Don't get tripped up by the wording. So let's look at A. Teach independence using natural contingencies. Will teaching the skill using natural contingencies be effective for maintenance? Absolutely. That's the entire idea. We want the natural environment to reinforce these skills we teach. We're not always going to be there in our contrived teaching environment to provide ongoing reinforcement. We need that natural reinforcement to occur in the everyday environment. So A would be effective at programming for maintenance. Therefore, we can eliminate it. B, implement a CRF schedule once teaching has stopped. Should we use continuous reinforcement to program for maintenance? Absolutely not, right? Continuous reinforcement is good for teaching. It's good for strengthening. Once that behavior is starting to strengthen, once that behavior is learned, we need to fade that schedule. The chances of continuous reinforcement occurring in the natural environment away from the teaching environment is very, very low. It is not a good way at all to program for maintenance when you use a continuous reinforcement schedule. B is our best answer so far. What is our rule? Our rule is we read all of our answer choices. We understand why the wrong answers are wrong, and we pick the best answer. So let's look at C. Continue to probe independence after teaching has ended. Absolutely. Probing independence, the skill we taught, after teaching is over, well, we're just checking for maintenance. This way we can confirm or deny that maintenance has occurred. If maintenance hasn't occurred, we can go back and work on it. If maintenance has occurred, then we've successfully programmed for maintenance. C is effective, we can eliminate it. And then D, ensure stakeholders are providing intermittent reinforcement. Of course, intermittent reinforcement is the opposite of continuous reinforcement. Even better that the stakeholders are providing that reinforcement. So when we're not there teaching, Reinforcement still occurring intermittently. D is effective at programming for maintenance. So the least effective, if we wanted to program for maintenance, would be B, implement a continuous reinforcement schedule once teaching has stopped. After careful consideration, Jan introduced a punishment procedure into her treatment plan. After training the RBT, she gave the RBT permission to implement the plan. Now, the client will not approach the RBT when the RBT arrives for session. Which of the following is the best explanation for what occurred? Pretty straightforward question. I don't think it's too difficult, uh, especially if you're pretty deep in your studying. What occurs? What is one of our ethical issues with punishment? Why is it sometimes our last option? Well, we know punishment is not permanent, okay? It doesn't teach a replacement behavior, but it can also create aversives, right? We can become aversive if all we're doing is delivering punishment. Think about an abusive relationship. People who offer up abuse become aversive. If we are constantly delivering punishment to our client, we can also become aversives. So if we look at this question, what happened? This RBT started the punishment procedure, and now the client does not want to go near that RBT. Okay, what's the best explanation? A, the punishment procedure was ineffective. We can't say if it was effective or not effective. How do we determine if punishment and reinforcement are effective or not effective. We look at the learner or the client's behavior. We don't know anything about their behavior except they won't go near their RBT anymore, okay? We don't know what behavior we're punishing. We just know now they're avoiding that RBT. So we can't say if the punishment procedure was ineffective or not. B, the client is engaging in tangible seeking behavior. If anything, this client is what? Well, they're trying to avoid, right? They're trying to avoid or escape this RBT. Nothing is said about tangibles or preferences or anything in this particular question, we can eliminate B. C, the RBT has become a conditioned aversive stimuli. Absolutely, right? Now this RBT, after punishment, 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 they've paired themselves with that punishment. The client is now avoiding 
them. They have become what they don't want to become, which is a conditioned aversive stimuli. RBTs should be rapport masters. RBTs should be conditioned reinforcing stimuli. When we show up, maybe the client doesn't necessarily care for us because we're the analyst. They only see us once every week, once every other week. That RBT, though, they need to be conditioned reinforcing stimuli. When that RBT shows up, that client should be jumping for joy, okay? Now, obviously, not all of them are going to be jumping for joy, but we should not be aversive. But when we pair ourselves with punishment, that's what occurs. C, so far, is our best explanation. D, the client is frustrated with the treatment plan. There's that word, frustration. You will not find that word, frustration, anywhere on the task list, anywhere in the study guide. It's a mentalism, okay? It's a fiction. It's a construct, right? We don't know how the client is feeling. It doesn't matter how the client is feeling, right? We don't, we're not worried about that. We're worried about what's actually occurring. What's actually occurring is the client avoiding the RBT. The RBT has most likely become a conditioned aversive stimuli through pairing. If you are teaching a receptive instruction lesson, you are teaching blank behavior. Kind of a little tricky question, okay? Um, something we, we don't talk about a ton, all right? We always talk about verbal operants, right? Manning, and verbal is tacting. But this listener behavior, right? It's just as important, okay? And if you're teaching receptive instructions, okay? So you're giving commands or orders or tasks, and you need the listener to follow those, well, what kind of behavior are you teaching? Well, that's supposed to be a D. You're obviously teaching listener behavior, right? Pretty easy question, uh, just to make sure you're aware that listener behavior is a thing. Now, if you've been studying a while, you probably are. If you're new, okay, listener behavior is actually something we talk about, okay? Um, so if you're teaching receptive instruction lessons, you're teaching listener behavior. While training a group of RBTs, Matt tells them that the most important thing to him is that the data they collect is reliable. What does Matt mean by this? All right, what does our data need to be? It needs to be accurate, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be valid. Matt, training RBTs, says he cares most about reliability. So Matt wants his data to be what? Is Matt most, most concerned with socially valid? data? Mm, no, because Matt is concerned with reliability. Reliability does not have to do with socially valid data. Of course, our target should be socially valid, but that's not what Matt's concern is. Matt wants reliability. B, the data reflects a true count or duration of what actually occurred. When we get data that reflects what truly occurred, that is called accuracy. That is accurate data. Okay. Remember, data can be accurate but unreliable, it can be valid, but inaccurate, on and on. C, the data reflects the target behavior. If we're actually measuring what we intend to measure, are we demonstrating validity or are we demonstrating reliability? If we're measuring what we actually want to measure, that's in the target behavior, that is validity. Matt wants reliability. He wants that data to be co consistently measured no matter, no matter how many times they measure it, no matter who's measuring it, okay? So Matt's preference, he doesn't care so much about accuracy or that the target behavior is valid. He just wants it reliable. If you're taking the data, he wants it consistent. So reliability is the equivalent to consistently measured data D. Which of the following answer choices best represents a scenario where reinforcement was effective? Okay, going back to question two, how do we determine if something is reinforcing or if it's punishing? We look at future behavior change. Consequences don't affect current behavior. Consequences affect future behavior. In order to determine if something is punishing or reinforcing, you need to look at the impact on future behavior. How does future behavior change? Does it change at all? That's what we're asking ourselves. So we need to find a scenario where reinforcement was effective. What kind of scenario are we looking for? When you're going through practice questions, try to start predicting answer choices. What do you think the answer is going to be? Okay, what are you looking for? You shouldn't be in a rush when you're studying. Okay, if you're in a rush when you're studying, you're going to be in a rush on the exam. Take your time studying 
accuracy is the most important thing. Get all the questions right. If you do 10 questions in a day, but you get all 10 right, it's way better than doing 40 questions and getting 30 of those wrong. Okay. Accuracy brings speed, right? So back to our question. Which of the following best represents a scenario where reinforcement was effective? We're looking for future behavior that did what? Future behavior that increased is what reinforcement does. A, Sandy spends a night in jail for shoplifting. Sandy stops shoplifting. What happened to Sandy's behavior? Sandy's behavior decreased. Spending a night in jail is punishing. B, John receives a Christmas bonus. John is happy. Hmm. Traditional technologies or traditional definitions might say this is reinforcing, but what do we say? John receives a Christmas bonus. John is happy. Is happy a behavior or measuring? No. Okay. That's an emotional state. We cannot determine, all right, what happened to John's behavior for whatever he received a Christmas bonus for. We just know his emotional state changed, but that doesn't prove this was reinforcing. Very important. C, Brenda is told to leave the dinner table for throwing food. Brenda throws food every week. Okay, so Brenda did what? She escaped. Now she throws food every week. Did her behavior change? Yeah, it maintained or it even increased. Okay, so far C is our best representative where reinforcement was effective. D, Bill receives praise for answering a question in class. Bill doesn't answer any more questions. All right, what happened to Bill's behavior? It decreased. Was praise reinforcing? No. Praise isn't always reinforcing, just like timeout isn't always punishing. We look at the future behavior, how it changes. The best case or best representative of a scenario of reinforcement is C. Brenda is told to leave the dinner table for throwing food. Brenda, behavior of throwing food, maintains slash increases. Which of the following measurement strategies is not associated with temporal extent? or temporal locus. Hopefully you've seen these two terms, temporal extent or temporal locus. It's a fancy way of talking about measurement. Temporal extent, okay, is, is the length of something. Temporal locus is its place and time. All right. And our third one is going to be repeatability. Okay. So those are our three dimensions of measurement. Which of the following measurement strategies is not associated with the dimensions of temporal extent or temporal locus? A, percentage. Is percentage associated with extent or locus? No, percentage is associated with frequencies, with rates. It's associated with repeatability, okay? A is our answer. Let's, why, let's figure out why the rest are wrong. B, duration. What is duration associated with? Well, duration is associated with length. It's associated with temporal extent. And to response time. And to response time has to do with place and time, right? The time in between behaviors when they occur. Temporal locus, and then latency, same thing. It's talking about the time in between an SD and a response. So the, when those things occur in time, therefore IRT and latency are both associated with temporal locus. So again, percentage, rate, frequency are associated with repeatability. Duration is associated with temporal extent. IRT latency is associated with temporal locus. Don't miss these questions on the exam if they ask them, okay? I've worked with so many future BCBAs who have done hours of studying and they skip over some of the simple stuff. You need to know everything, even the simple stuff, okay? Study everything. Brittany works as a behavior analyst in an addiction clinic. She falls in love with her client and she decides she wants to date him. She terminates her service with that client and they begin a relationship. Is this acceptable? Now, remember, <clears throat> excuse me, our ethical code just changed. Okay, we have updated ethics. By our study guy, go to our site. We have a breakdown of those ethics, okay? When you answer ethic questions on the BCBA exam, all right, we are going by a black and white definition of ethics. We know real world, things get gray. The exam wants a black and white explanation. What does the task list say? What does our ethical code say? In this case, what does the ethical code say about dating clients, okay, either during service or after service? A, 
It is acceptable. They are both consenting adults and she is not providing services. Well, they are consenting. She is allowed to date him. But the issue becomes what? The issue becomes how quickly they started that relationship. That's what the task list really touches on when it comes to client and stakeholder dating. Okay. So B, no, she is not allowed to begin a relationship with a present or former client. Incorrect. You can date clients or stakeholders, okay? But there's a time restraint on it. There's a time constriction. C, no, she must wait 30 days before beginning her relationship with the client. Is 30 days accurate? Well, let's look at D. No, she must wait two years before beginning her relationship with the client. Which one is it? 30 days or two years? It's going to be D. She must wait two years before beginning her relationship with the client. Straight from the task list or the ethical code. They want a black and white ethical answer. All right. That's important to them. You will get asked ethical questions. It's not like the RBT exam so much where the ethical questions are common sense. Super straightforward, super easy. You kind of need to know the details of the ethics. Okay. Don't get burned by them on the exam. Now, once you get a hang of them, they do become common sense. But there are some specifics that you just want to know. And things like how long do you need to wait before dating a client? Something you want to know. That answer is going to be two years. Of the following, what records should you review as a behavior analyst at the outset of treatment? That word outset confused me so much when I first started studying. Okay. What does outset mean? Outset means the beginning, at the beginning. They love to use outset. Okay. When you see outset, just think beginning. So this question is really asking at the beginning of treatment, what should you re what records should you review? A, medical. Does it matter their medical history? Absolutely. When we are evaluating behavior, behavior occurs, we first rule out what? Medical reasons. If this kid has chronic headaches and he's grabbing his head, parsimony, parsimoniously, would the simplest explanation, in other words, would be a medical reason. So we, of course, want to at least whatever medical records are available, want to be familiar with them. It doesn't mean you need to look through detailed surgery and medicinal records, but you need to have an idea of any other things, diagnoses, anything going on with the client. What about B, education? Do IEPs matter? Do 504s matter? 100%. Knowing what's going on in school, very important, okay? What about historical data? Do you need to know past ABA services? Do you need to know how they reacted to past services? Do you need to know about any abuse? any neglect, um, any divorce, anything. Absolutely. All of this stuff is going to be relevant to you, right? When you're starting your treatment, it's going to help you start forming a picture of what your treatment's going to look like. So what records do you need to review? Medical, education, and historical. Therefore, answer is going to be D, all the above. A major component of discrete trial training is delivering feedback after a response or non-response is given. Which of the following answer choices will be the best way to deliver feedback for correctly engaging in the target behavior of answering what is two plus two? Okay, I like to ask this question to my RBTs as well. I think it's a, a, a really good DTT question because I think DTT feedback suffers. I think DTT can get repetitive. I think people get lazy, but there's a very specific way we should be delivering feedback for discrete trial training. First off, what are we looking at? What are we identifying? We're identifying the behavior of interest. What is two plus two? That is what we're reinforcing. That is what is getting feedback. So if we need to find the best way to deliver feedback for correctly engaging in that behavior, what is that going to look like? A, nice job sitting in your chair. You earned a token. Is sitting in the chair the target behavior? If sitting in the chair is the target behavior and you're the behavior analyst, you need to write sitting in your chair is reinforced. If not, we're only worried about that target behavior, okay? That happens all the time in DTT where the kid does something good, but it's not exactly the target, and that's all we start worrying about, okay? We're starting to drift with treatment. B, yes, that is correct. You earned a token. What's missing? Well, you need to label the behavior. What is correct? Okay, maybe the kid's three or two or 
uh, low functioning or doesn't understand what you're talking about. That is correct might mean nothing. But if you start labeling the behavior, all right, we're putting some meaning behind it. So always label the behavior. B is also incorrect. C, yes, two plus two does equal four. You earned a token. Perfect, right? We label our behavior. Okay, you give the feedback, you give the token. C is best answer so far. D, the answer is four, but you were fidgeting, so you did not earn a token. Hmm. Kind of the opposite of A. They engaged in the right behavior. We're not going to punish them, okay, because they're fidgeting when fidgeting has nothing to do with what we're targeting. If you want to target fidgeting, target fidgeting. But based on our information, our target is what is 2 plus 2. They answered it correctly. Give them the token. Give them feedback. Give them praise. So the best answer here is C. Yes, 2 plus 2 does equal 4. Label the behavior. You earned a token. Finally, recently, your client is eloping from the table when presented with a difficult task demand. The client will run to his room, scream, slam the door, and lock the door. The client's dad took the lock off the door. Now your client cannot lock his door anymore. The dad taking the lock off the door is what type of intervention? Okay. Remember, we have antecedent interventions and we have consequence interventions. Antecedent interventions are what? They're preventative. We're trying to prevent something from happening. Consequence interventions are reactive. We're reacting to something happening. If we, or the client's dad, I should say, no longer wants the client to lock the door, he takes the lock off of the door. Is he preventing a behavior from happening or is he reacting? Well, he's preventing it. Okay, so be very careful here, right? We don't know how he reacted to when the client locked the door. All we know is now the client no longer can do that because it's being prevented by dad's antecedent intervention of taking the lock off of the door, okay? Not a consequence intervention, because it's not reacting to it, it's preventing future behavior from occurring. And then D, differential reinforcement. Are we reinforcing other behaviors? No, right, there's no reinforcement. He's just preventing the behavior from occurring at all, okay? So what is dad doing? A preventative measure, it's an A, 